So this is, as you know, a conference about big data. And we like to think of data as something concrete and expressionless, like a brick factory or parking lot or even Mitt Romney. But I'm going to talk today about how data can sometimes be a little slippery. And I'm going to present the results of these three wine experiments that Julie mentioned we conducted the other night at the, the Mini Maker Fair that test three little nigs that can sometimes get in the way of proper inference. That social influence, the effect of context on value, and the effect of expectation, expectation on uh, perception and preference. So I said just now that data can be slippery, but we might also call it unctuous or glacé, redolent of spring rain and fresh plum. And in doing so, we're evoking metaphors, and what are metaphors but another model of the world? So for a long time, we've been trying to quantify hedonic things. It makes sense. If we can measure and model the things that we enjoy, we can also optimize to have more of them. So this is a wine aroma wheel. It's an example of an attempt to turn flavors into something somewhat scientific. Uh, the problem is it's also something somewhat imaginative. I mean, what does wet dog actually taste like? Can wine really be rubbery? At the other end of the spectrum, we have a mass spectrometer, which is a very expensive um, way to smash wine apart and measure the volatile compounds they're in. The problem here is that the human nose is actually far more sensitive. We can detect hundreds, maybe thousands of different aromas. The problem is we can't consistently recognize um, what they map to. Um, the, the point here is that context matters a lot. So this is a map of the three experiments we did the other night. There were three of them. And the first thing we did was to separate you into VIPs and non-VIPs. If you were a VIP, you got a little sticker on your badge. It was typically people who checked in on Monday. And you got to taste a special wine. Everybody else went into experiment one, where they tasted um, a couple of less special wines. And then everybody had the option to participate in experiment three, which was with the note cards and filling out the descriptors. So the top question I've been getting is, what were the wines we were tasting? Here they are. Experiments one and two used wines A through C. And in experiment three, we had C and D. Um, so you can see there were a range of prices and varietals, um, from the cheapest, the Woodbridge Cabernet, to the La Crema, which is the, the most expensive. And those are sort of notes from the, from the winemakers. So this is experiment one. We wanted to test. Um, the effect of social influence on, on taste and perception. The, basically, in other words, um, if a lot of people appear to like a wine, will that make you like it more too? Um, so we divided you into two groups. Um, there was a treatment and a control. And um, to test the effect of social influence, we basically artificially, behind the scenes, added more votes to uh, wine B, um, we actually didn't get to the second hour. Um, wine B was the Woodbridge, the, the cheap Cabernet. So what happened? The first sort of astounding thing is that um, everybody really liked the Merlot blend. In Across Experiments 1 and 2, about 60 to 70 percent of you chose that as your favorite. You could see there was a slight effect of um, increasing the votes, but it, it wasn't um, enough to sort of uh, qualify as, as statistically significant. Um, we suspect because it was a very weak uh, social influence, you just saw it on the, the voting machines, not while you were tasting the wines. In experiment two, um, we wanted to test the effect of believing a wine was special on people's preferences. So there you tasted one wine, which you were told was normal, um, open to everybody in experiment one as well. Um, and because you were a VIP, you also got to taste this second special wine. Now, at one of the tables, this wine was the cheap uh, Woodbridge Cabernet, and at the other, it was the most expensive Pinot Noir. Um, what happened here was actually kind of interesting. If you um, were told you were tasting a special wine and it was the expensive one, you actually liked it more. If you were told you were tasting a special wine and it was the cheap one, you liked it less than the, the baseline. And we're also investigating a sort of um, what we're calling the killjoy bartender effect here. Um, there was one fellow who was outraged at having to um, beguile tasters and tell them that the special wine was actually the, the cheapest one. Um, so see, he sort of alternatively gave them the evil eye and then after they left, uh, mocked them if they picked the, the Woodbridge. Um, 
In experiment three, we were testing the effect of priming with certain flavors, colors, and moods on the, the flavors that people would perceive in the wine. So we gave you note cards, one that sort of evoked a purple mood. It had grapes on it, it had magenta text, and the other that evoked a green, sort of earthy mood. It had wet leaves, a bridge, green text. Um, and that we, then we had half of you taste um, the wines in one combination. This was sort of the coherent combination. If you believe the reviewers, Pinot Noir is supposed to um, taste sort of earthy, and Merlot is more juicy uh, berry flavors. And then the other in the second half, we had sort of discoherent flavors. So we wanted to see what would happen. Um, interestingly here, a larger percentage of people preferred the Pinot. Um, although in the second case, they especially liked the Merlot, if they were told it um, was earthy. And it turns out priming had a, a, a pretty big effect. So if you receive the purple note card, independent of which wine you chose, you were more likely to circle flavors like black cherry, red fruits, berry juicy, these kinds of things. And conversely, if you received the green prime, uh, you were more likely to say the wine was peppery, woodsy, smoky, that kind of thing. This is another way of showing it on a bump chart. It shows the change in the rank um, based on what, how you were primed. And there was sort of an interesting effect of um, coherence. So it, it seems that if in the cases where there was discoherence, where um, you were primed with something and you were tasting the other one, the more neutral words actually uh, rose a bit in rank. So there are people, uh, Julie already thanked some of these people, but I want to re-emphasize a huge thank you for Brian Jepson, who, dis who designed and created the Magnus Fitton voting machines, John Lay, who was instrumental in helping um, with the charts and the analysis, uh, Monique Sims, who really put it together in terms of logistics, and Ed and Alistair, who were enthusiastic about it the entire way. There's uh, Brian's voting machine. Um, and if I want to leave you with sort of one final thought, it's, it's this. Um, you know, all these tools we've been discussing over the past three days, um, they're, they're helping to solve the important problems in, in data. Um, but I do think that there are some things that are sometimes better left to heuristics or, or even chance. So the point of, of these experiments is not that you should now go out and try to measure the effect of um, your friends on the market share of different wines, but rather that tastes are tricky things. They're notoriously difficult to pin down. So I'll leave you with a sort of Surgeon General for Data's uh, warning, um, which is that the excessive consumption of data analysis may limit your ability to enjoy simple pleasures. So quantify in moderation. Thank you.